is not an exaggeration to say that this was the most tumultuous week in the last four years. Still not over. <laughs> and uh, if you have had tumult in your personal life, you know that there is no rest and that there is no peace and that there is constant aggravation. And the reason why I chose this scripture reading uh, to begin my talk today is because it is not a surprise that the world is tumultuous. The world is tumultuous because the hearts of men are tumultuous. Mm -hmm. And we are told by scripture that the heart of man, people, is desperately wicked and who can know it? And so when the world is tumultuous, it is a reflection only of what is in the heart of people. It is not a surprise. It ought to surprise none of us. And it may seem like the boat is filling with water. Perhaps at the end of this week, it feels like the boat is filling with water for you because of your personal life, because of what is going on in the world, because of what is going on in the country. But when Jesus spoke to the storm, there was a great calm. Hallelujah. And so, when we come here in this place here today, and we invite the Lord's presence to be here, it is so that there will be a great calm. The Bible says, great will be your peace. So irrespective of what is going on in the outside world, today we are going to talk about what is going on in the inside world. And it is God's intention to give us peace. Let's bow our heads. Our kind Heavenly Father, Lord, there is nothing perplexing in this world for you. You are calm above the storm. All things are laid out to your eternal eye. Lord, you know the end from the beginning. You see all things. You are not confused by any of it. You know what you will do. You know how you will bring events to a close on this earth. And Lord, it is your desire that there would be peace. And Lord, we pray that your presence will come into this place here now into the hearts of the people, that there would be a great calm, that we will leave the things that are on the outside world, Lord, alone, that will come here before you, that will rest with you, that will be taught of you. I pray, Lord, that as we speak of eternal things, that you will be with you, and that you will be with this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Now then, It was reported in the magazine of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News on July 10, 2020, that scientists have taken a bacteria called R. sophidophilum, and it is a purple bacteria that grows in the ocean. And our sophidophilum has been harnessed, the power of this bacteria has been harnessed to do something incredible. Some years ago, scientists looked into the animal kingdom and they thought to themselves, what is stronger than steel? What is more elastic than rubber? What can we take from the animal kingdom and use it for our purposes? And probably in this church, no matter how good the cleaners are, if you look in the crannies, as Solomon said, in the palaces of kings, they live. What is it? A spider. A spider. Spiders live in the, in the palaces of kings. They live here in this church. And they make, some of them make webs. And the spider's web is 10 times stronger than steel 
and more elastic than rubber. And it is made in glands in the spider, and then it is spun out through narrow tubes, and the ends of it are capable of being interlocked. It's an absolute complete marvel of engineering. There's no substance like it on the face of the earth in the animal kingdom. And scientists looked and they thought to themselves, what can we do to take this substance and mass produce it? And so they took the genes from the spider and they put them into a goat. And when they milked the goat, in the milk of the goat was the strands of the spider. And they were going to take that and mass produce it and make, uh, is this thing too high, too low maybe? Okay. If I fiddle with it, is that better? All right. They were going to take the strands from the goat's milk and make clothing out of it. In fact, you can make something that is like Kevlar with a fraction of the weight using the silk of a spider. It will stop a bullet with a fraction of the weight. It has all these incredible uh, uses, you know, in armament and in tanks and in bulletproof clothing but also in uh, making new ropes and making new clothing that doesn't wear out and light fabrics that the world has never seen before, sutures in medicine that uh, the body will not reject and that are so tiny you can barely see them. But there was a problem with the goat's milk. Uh, the, the strands were not the way that they wanted them and so they have taken the gene from two spiders, combined them, and implanted the gene in our sophidophilum. And this purple bacteria is mass producing the silk from the spider. And it's an incredible marvel of engineering. Now this bacteria does not normally produce the silk of a spider. It produces whatever it does naturally. But you do not get spider silk from a goat or from a bacteria without the insertion of a gene into this creature. And you might ask yourself, why is it that they don't just go out and gather the spiders, put them in a lab or factory, and have the spiders make the silk? Why don't they do that? Well, it turns out that spiders are murderous little creatures. <laughs> And if you take a bunch of spiders and you put them in an enclosed space, they make war on each other, and they murder each other, and they eat each other. And good luck trying to get them to mate with each other when all they want to do is kill each other. And so it's impossible to mass produce this in a lab using spiders. And it is impossible also to go out and harvest the silk out in the forest. If all of us go out and we harvest the silk from all of the spider webs that we find, it would take decades to make what is needed. And so the only way to do it is to take the gene and put it into something that will make the silk in the animal kingdom. And so they have chosen Arsophodophilum. And uh, this reminds me of the impossibility of the leopard changing his spots or the zebra his stripes. And it reminds me of the kingdom of God. The Bible says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? It is an impossibility. And so, you see from the spider's silk that something from outside of the bacteria or outside of the goat has to be done in order to implant that gene into these creatures. How many of you are gardeners? If you do not plant seed, what grows? Weeds. Only weeds. Universally weeds. And when Jesus talked about the parable of the sower going out to sow his seed, he is taking, the sower is taking something that is outside of the garden. It does not exist in the garden. It must be implanted by the gardener. It must come from outside of the furrows of the soil. 
And so, Jesus came, and before he came, John the Baptist came, and you know what John the Baptist preached. He preached, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, what does at hand mean? What does it mean the kingdom of God is at hand? What does it mean? Here. It means it is here. It means it is now. It means that the kingdom of God is here. And yet the Jews at that particular time period, they were looking for a kingdom that had not arrived. And in fact, we know, was never going to arrive. They hated the Romans. They hated being under the thumb of the Roman Empire. And they were looking for an earthly kingdom. And when John the Baptist came preaching, saying the kingdom of God is at hand, they looked around and they said, what are you talking about? We're slaves here. Where is this kingdom? And then Jesus came preaching, and he preached. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was 2,000 years ago. And yet Jesus at that time period said the kingdom of heaven is at hand 2,000 years ago. What kingdom is he speaking of? Matthew chapter 4. If you look in your Bibles with me. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23. It says that Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And if you go to Matthew 12, verse 28, Matthew 12, verse 28, <coughs> Jesus was accused of casting out devils by the power of the devil. Jesus responded to the people who accused him of this, and they said, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So there is an earthly kingdom, which is the natural kingdom. It is the garden of weeds. But then there is a different power. And Jesus comes with this different power. And he overthrows the state of things that exist with his power. And he implants a different kingdom. And if you go to Matthew 13, one chapter over. One chapter over, Matthew 13. Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. Uh, verse 18. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. Jesus said, Listen or hear the parable of the sower. This is the gardener. So There's a lesson here. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So, what, there, are, there are a lot of things in this verse that we can pick out. First of all, when one hears the word of the kingdom, Jesus came preaching the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Just hold that in your thoughts. He's preaching that something is here now. Not a kingdom where a king sits or where a particular form of government sits, or where the powers of earth all come together, united under one banner. No, he's saying that the kingdom is here now, and that the kingdom is for you now, and that it is implanted in the heart like a sower in the garden. He takes the seed from outside, and he walks over and he makes a furrow, and he puts the seed in the soil, he implants the seed into the soil. And then, it says in the verse, that when the wicked one comes, he catches away that which was sown in his heart. 
What was sown in the heart? The seed. So where is the kingdom? It is in the heart. The gospel of, of the kingdom is preached so that you will receive something from outside of yourself. What does the heart produce normally? Wheat. What is the spider like? Right? He's a murderous little creature. Jesus said to the, to the people of the day, he said, you are of your father the devil. And his works you will do. He's talking about the natural state of a person. Your heart is this way, right? And I'm sure that they were very offended by that. But he's just talking about the reality of what the garden looks like without the seed, without the preparation of the soil. Humanity is a bunch of selfish, tyrannical, ambitious, nasty little creatures. That's the reality. And so, the parable of the seed is taking something that is outside and putting it into the heart of a person and covering it up and watching it. And if you turn with me in your Bible, this is a bit of a departure here. I hadn't planned to do this, but I, you know, I was, was the verse is in my head here as I speak. It's Isaiah chapter 27, I believe. Uh, Isaiah chapter 27. Uh, verse 1, it says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, and even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in, that, in the sea. In that day sing you unto her a vineyard of red wine. Sing unto the vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment lest any hurt it, and I will keep it day and night. Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle, says the Lord? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or, alternatively, the Lord says, let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. This is talking about the garden of your heart. That the Lord looks at it, and He waters it, and He tends it, and He prepares the soil until it is time to take the seed of the kingdom and plant it into the soil. And then He waters it, and He cares for it, and He loves it. And the vineyard grows, and it produces a harvest because of the care of the Creator. And so... Let's go back to Matthew. The seed is sown in the heart. It comes from the outside. And in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, if you turn with me there. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. I'll give you a moment there to get there. Luke 17, verse 20, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, because Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is at hand, the kingdom of heaven is here, repent. And the Pharisees are demanding him, saying, when is it going to come? We don't see it. Right? They're saying, we don't see it. When is the kingdom going to come? You have to think about what the world was like back then. Back then. The Jewish nation was under the control of the Roman Empire. Their conception of the kingdom was that this tremendous event would come, Messiah would come, he would overthrow the Romans, there would be an earthly kingdom where the Jewish nation was raised again into the prominence of David and Solomon. And that's what they're looking for. They're saying, when is this going to happen? We want to see it. If you're the Messiah, tell us. When is it going to happen? And Jesus' answer says so much. He said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. What does that mean? It does not come with observation. 
In other words, you can't see it. You can't see it. You can't point to it and you can't say, well, the kingdom of heaven is here because now this person is in the White House. Or the kingdom of, of the world is here because this person is on the throne of the United Nations. Okay, Jesus is saying the kingdom is not something that you can observe and see. This is not God's kingdom. This is not what it is. All right, that's not what it is. It's not what it's about. And so the people who are looking for some sort of earthly empire, there's this theology these days called kingdom now theology. And the people who believe in kingdom now theology believe that certain people have to control government, control entertainment, control education, control society, control the narrative, control the economy, and then the kingdom will be here. The kingdom will come. Jesus will return, right? And they are looking to establish an earthly kingdom. But what does Jesus say about the earthly kingdom? He's saying, that's not it. That's not it. And when you think about this in your head, you'll realize why this is. Why is this the way? Because the natural heart of a person cannot make the kingdom of heaven. Amen. If you take a bunch of murderous spiders together, and you put them in a big city, you're never going to get utopia. Again. There's never going to be a spider utopia. Because all they do, when you put them together, it's like what happens in any big city, you put everybody together, and what happens? Crime goes up. Why does crime go up? It's because everybody's wicked, and they're living in close, close proximity, and so they do wicked things. This is not a mystery, okay? It's not a surprise to anybody. Or it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And there's no solution from this world. The solution comes from outside of this world. Amen. Okay, that's the only place that it can come from. So Jesus says, the kingdom does not come with observation. You cannot see it. And to drive home the point, he says in verse 21, this is Luke chapter 17, verse 21, neither shall they say, lo here, or lo there. Okay? So when the kingdom does come, you're not going to be able to see it. Okay, Let's put this in our heads here. You're not going to be able to see it. When the kingdom comes, you cannot see it. And nobody is going to be able to say, this is where it is. Or this is where it is over here. It's not going to be like that. Why? Because, Jesus said, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. It is within you. And that is what God cares about. He cares about the fundamental transformation of the heart. Amen. He cares about the implanting of a different principle. We all know what our hearts are like without Christianity, without the Spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus in our lives. Amen. Because we went through this stage of life before. Okay, Let's not forget it. Right? That's like Paul's saying, right? Don't forget what it used to be like. Lest you fall. Right? Lest you fall. Remember what it was like. I know what my life was like. You wouldn't, not, you wouldn't invite me to preach at your church. I would. I remember what I was like. Yeah. I, we remember. In fact, people sometimes, you don't know me because I, you know, I come from a different land. But people, if I preach up in certain places in the North area, they come to me and they say, you were on the road to perdition. How is it that you're standing up on the podium now? Right? Because they see what I was, and they see what Jesus has made me now. And they, they recognize that there was a fundamental change. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, I was suspended nine times in grade nine. Uh, you know, the, the police Grace. were involved. Grace. You know? and, uh, but the Lord was merciful to me, a sinner, through a long process of time all of the very foolish and very wicked things that I did. Right? And I'm not where he wants me to be, but I am certainly not where I was. Yeah. Right? And each of us can testify. If you have tasted the Lord Jesus, you know that you are not who you were. Okay? Now, if you have not tasted the Lord Jesus, then Christianity is a misery to you because you're thinking to yourself, I want to be like this and I'm trying to be like this and I'm never going to make it. Newsflash. You're never going to make it. 
Okay? You are never going to make it. Alright? That goat, no matter how many times you milk the goat, there will never be spider silk in the goat's milk. Because the goat does not produce spider silk in its natural state. Alright? And so this is what Jesus is saying. So let's continue to study the gospel of the kingdom. Because there is a mystery here. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Amen. Now, if you turn me with me to your Bibles, uh, with me in your Bibles, to Mark chapter 10, verse 15. Mark 10, 15. <coughs> Let us look at this kingdom from a different perspective. Because Jesus is going somewhere with this whole thing. Alright? He's teaching people about their need. He's, he is going to overthrow the fundamental old order of things, which is why he came. And he says, Mark, verse 10, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 15, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter into it. When I was out with a friend of mine and his children, we were a long ways up a creek one day, we were hunting for shark's teeth. And my friend's daughter came to me. It was the end of the day. They'd been digging. They'd been shoveling. They'd been looking for shark's teeth. They find so many of them. They found hundreds of them. And at the end of the day, she was hungry. And she was trying to open up a bag of pretzels so that she could eat it. And because her hands were weak and they were wet, she could not do it. And so she came to me and she said, Uncle Jay, can you open this for me? And that is the trusting faith of a little child. Number one, the recognition that it is impossible for her to do it. Number two, the recognition that there is somebody who will. Number three, the request to help for help. And these are the attributes. These are the attributes. These are the characteristics. These are the things that heaven values. Heaven values the person who looks and they say, I cannot do this. I'm never going to do it. You have to do it. Please do it. Amen. And then you just wait. And you say, with trust, I trust that you will do it. And that is the person who receives the kingdom of heaven in their heart. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, Verse 34, Come you blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom of heaven. And then he talks about the things that the people who inherit the kingdom of heaven, what did they do? They fed the naked, or they fed the hungry, they clothed the naked. Maybe they fed the naked too. Maybe those people are hungry as well. <laughs> but Jesus, he talks about the things that these people do. Right? Right? But the thing that you can't miss with this whole thing, and this is really the crux of this whole talk, is that Jesus does not teach that the way to get to the kingdom of heaven is to do things that are unnatural to you. The way to get to the kingdom of heaven is to receive something from outside of yourself that is implanted, and then to do the things that come, that spring, that grow up from that. Right? Now, when Jesus says, Come you blessed of my Father, it makes me wonder who is blessed. When this world was created, God and humanity had a rift. There was a separation. There was a separation. And uh, because of that separation, because of sin, God did not hold face-to-face -face communication with people anymore. They could not see Him and live because of the difference between His character and their character and His glory compared to their spider nature. He would just consume everything because it cannot stand in His presence. For 4,000 years, God waited to hold communion with people face to face in the person of His Son. You 
Think about the passage of that time. 4,000 years. You think about all the things that God wants to say. 4,000 years is a long time. He's thinking about what he would say to humanity. How can I reach humanity? What is the most important thing for me to say to my children who are in darkness? And if you turn with